In this episode of Woodlands on the Web, we're going to continue our AP Chemistry Unit 6 discussion on thermochemistry, but this time focusing on calorimetry and enthalpy. So first, let's review calorimetry. In honors chemistry, we did an experiment where we mixed a hot metal with some room temperature or cold water, and we observed the temperature changes to, dis to determine the specific heat capacity of the metal. So we're basically talking about the same process here. Uh, we're talking about what happens when we mix things together and a temperature change occurs. And this is the type of process or technique that we can use in order to help us determine the enthalpy change or the, um, the quantity of heat changes in these conditions. As you can see here, if the pressure is constant, we can basically assume that Q is, our also, is also our delta H. A couple of things worth pointing out here are that the Q equals MC delta T formula is the same. They're just including that subscript for P for specific heat capacity. Um, it's important to remember that we know the specific heat of water, but the most important thing is that the heat lost by a substance is the amount of heat that is gained by the water. And that amount or quantity is the same integer. The only difference is that the thing being lost is going to be considered a negative Q value and the heat gained by the water is going to be a positive Q value. I also wanted to point out the difference here between lowercase calories and capital C calories. So when you're looking at a food label and it's talking about the calories per serving, that's always written with a capital C because it's actually referring to a kilocalorie. Now let's look at a, an example of a calorimetry problem that's just a little bit different than what we've done in honors. So in this particular case, we're looking at mixing two solutions together and we're looking at the initial and final temperature of that mixture. And we're also making some assumptions. So basically by assuming that the density is one and the specific heat capacity is 4.184, what we're saying is that these aqueous solutions are going to behave very much like water when we mix them together. So that makes our math quite a bit easier because then we can just use our values that we know for water. Okay, it is asking us to calculate our enthalpy change. But again, since there is no temperature, or sorry, no pressure change, we're going to say that our enthalpy is going to be the same as our Q value. So we can go ahead and Q use our Q equals MC delta T formula. I'm gonna go ahead and write that out as T2 minus T1. And the main thing to be careful of here is since we're mixing these two solutions together, our total mixture is going to be 200 milliliters, which means it's gonna be 200 grams, again, assuming that its density is basically water's density. We'll be using the specific heat of water, so 4.184. And if we're doing our temperature change, our final temperature is 31.3 degrees Celsius, and our initial temperature was 24.6 degrees Celsius. Okay, when we solve that math, we get a positive 5,600 joules. Now, I want to point out here that this is actually a little bit misleading, the way that this question is written, because if you think about it, if we started at 24.6 degrees Celsius and the mixture goes up in temperature, then that means that that beaker or flask is going to feel warmer to you. Okay, and this I just want to point out coincides with what we said in our previous unit about titration. So when we mix acids and bases together, oftentimes we feel a rise in the temperature of that particular system, okay? And the reason that we end up with a positive value here, which indicates an endothermic process, is because we are talking about what is the system versus the surroundings. It's a little bit more of a semantics issue here, okay? So I would still describe that as an exothermic process, but in this case, it's, it doesn't look that way because the thing you were measuring is actually essentially the surroundings. So it's a little bit misleading. All right, now this is an example where we're going back to kind of that stoichiometry concept. So we have a mole of methane that we are burning at a constant pressure. So again, Q and delta H are essentially the same thing. We have a, an amount of energy that's released as heat 
and we're trying to figure out the delta H for the entire process. Okay, in this particular case, we're starting out with only 5.8 grams of methane, not an entire mole. So it's going to be a stoichiometry problem where we start out with that as our given. And as we saw in the previous example on the previous video, we can use our um, kilojoules per mole of energy. That's going to be a conversion factor because we have, remember I've said anytime you have a unit where it's already a fraction, it is most likely going to be a conversion factor. So since that's kilojoules per mole, then we want to get grams into moles. All right, and the molar mass is 16.0, oh, excuse me, 49. And we're going to use that enthalpy value. But again, here I would use it as negative 890 kilojoules because it says that that much is released. And if you're talking about combustion, which you are here because you're saying the word burned, this is specifically going to be an enthalpy of combustion because we're burning something. So when we divide out our units and do our math, we get negative 322 kilojoules of energy. And that's how much energy is being released when we only burn 5.8 grams as opposed to an entire mole of it. Okay, exercise seven is extremely similar to exercise five. So I would actually encourage you to pause the video here and go ahead and try this one for yourself. It's a similar situation where you're mixing two solutions together. So please try that on your own first and then unpause when you're ready to move on. Okay, so go ahead and pause, please. All right, hopefully you got this answer, 26,000 joules. But if you did not, probably the reason is because you may have forgotten to convert liters to milliliters because when we're talking about grams, we're talking about milliliters of water. So one liter of barium nitrate is going to be 1,000 grams of the solution. And again, we're assuming the density and the specific heat being essentially water. So you can use the numbers interchangeably, but you do have to remember that you are talking about a difference of a, a power of a, a thousand. Now we're going to start talking about enthalpy of formation. So that's what delta H F stands for, F being formation. Okay, so this is how much energy it takes to form, um, or I should say, uh, the amount of energy that gets released when these things get broken apart. Uh, we'll get more to that in just a second when we talk about bond energies and everything. Uh, but the most important thing to know from this section is that any elements in their standard state have an enthalpy of zero, okay? You need to remember that this is going to include your diatomic elements, okay? Uh, additionally, this is just a review. We talked about standard laboratory conditions or standard conditions there, so that's a review of that again. Um, the table here is something you would get as a reference, so if you are being asked a question related to um, heats of formation or enthalpy of formation, you would be given the data for that, or you might be finding uh, an unknown based on having some known ones. Okay, the law that you see at the bottom is known as Hess's law. So this should sound really familiar because it actually is the law that we've been saying. So the heat of the reaction is the heat of your products minus the heat of your reactants. And now what we're saying, those numbers, where, where those numbers actually come from, is it's specifically the heat of formation of the products and the reactants. Okay, so we're going to look at the overall enthalpy change for this particular reaction. So the easiest way for us would be if we had the reaction energy profile. But in this case, we don't. We only have a table of heats of formation for the different substances. Okay, so we're going to um, go in order of these. And so we're going to need to sum up a lot of products because there are several of them. The other important thing here is that we understand that we're going to be applying coefficients as multiples of these heat of formation values. So hopefully you'll see what I mean in just a second. Okay, so we're going to start out with the heat of formation of Al2O3. So that value is negative 1676. Okay, we're going to add the ALCL3, which is a negative 704. 
So I'm just plugging in the numbers from the chart. Okay, we're going to add three nitrogen monoxides, and that's a positive 90, so I'm not going to change anything there. And we're also going to add that to six waters. So we're going to say six times negative 242. All right, so that's all of my products. Now I'm going to subtract the sum of my reactants. Okay, so I have three aluminums. And it shows here, or I should say, based on what we just talked about before, yes, there would be three of them, because, but because that's an element in its pure state, it would be zero for aluminum because it's not going to have a heat of formation. It already exists. Okay, so we're going to have that plus our other reactant, the ammonium perchlorate. So that value is negative 295. Okay. So the main thing I would say to be careful about is make sure that you're distributing your negatives appropriately or that you're, you're doing your order of operations appropriately. Just be careful with your parentheses. But you should get negative 2,677 kilojoules because that table was in kilojoules per mole. Okay, so related to this picture, this picture, first of all, is showing an exothermic reaction, which I know because this value is negative. But if I were looking at the specific numbers for that, the value for this reactant up here would be this value, 3 times negative 295. The value for the heat of formation of the products would be what was on the bottom there. So this is where those actual values are coming from. You know, we've talked before about how it's potential energy. Yes, and that potential energy is dis or called specifically the heat of formation. Exercise 9 is very similar to exercise 8. The only difference is that you have the, um, the total given to you because you have this value over here. So my most important question to you is this, is this particular value, if you were calling it just the delta H, is this positive or negative based on having it on the product side? Think about that first. And then see if you can substitute in and find the heat of formation of the reactants. Because in this particular case, we don't know what they are. So pause the video here, see if you can do it. And then once you're done, you can unpause and check your work. Okay, so here's your solution. And like I said, I wanted you to decide, is that 2800 positive or negative? Because it is on the product side, that means that that is an exothermic reaction. Also, it's combustion, and we should know that heat is always released when we combust something. So that value needs to be negative when you plug it in as your answer for the delta H, because it's basically your um, delta H of combustion in this case, because that's a combustion reaction. Okay. The other thing I wanted to point out is I was trying to show specifically that for your reactants, the X is referring to your glucose, but the zero is referring to the oxygen, again, because that's an element in its, in its standard state. So again, that's gonna have a heat of formation of zero. So the reason you can figure out the heat of glucose easily is because you can assume that the, the heat of formation for the oxygen is zero, okay? Then you just basically solve for X, and you'll get that your, um, Heat of formation of the glucose is negative 1,275.8 kilojoules specifically. And last for this video, please pause and try exercise 10 before going on and checking your work. This one should have been pretty straightforward as long as you identified that aluminum and iron would have heat of formation of zero. The only thing that might have been tricky is that you had to recognize that you needed to refer back to the, um, the enthalpy of formation for the rust and the Al203. So the, I got those values off of the table that was earlier in the video. This concludes part two of AP Chemistry Unit 6 discussion. Um, thank you for watching, and I hope you learned something.